Okay, so shall we get started? And then, um, so you had a number of chapters to read, right, for this? Okay. So there's not going to be much on the chapters. And more of what I wanted to outline is um, some of the clinical trials that have been done both for diabetic macular edema and for diabetic retinopathy. I don't even think they're in your books yet. And, and it's been really an exciting time in diabetes. And so I thought that I would focus on that and some of the quizzes on that as well. If you have any specific questions about anything that's in the text, though, ask me, and we'll try to get to those at the end, okay? So um, anyway, this is kind of our, our the, the outline. We'll talk about some of the rationale for VEGF inhibition, because vascular endothelial growth factor is, is a, a hot, or maybe not hot topic, but I would say a prevalent topic in diabetes and other diseases. And then we'll also talk about uh, specifically diabetic macular edema, PDR, clinical trials, but also safety considerations, because I think that's something we always have to think about when we're treating our patients. Um, so first, just a little bit on the epidemiology. This is, I think, mainly in your book, that diabetes is estimated to affect 18 million Americans, 8.3% uh, of the population. So, and in some states, it's really higher than that and on the rise. And, and it seems to be associated with the obesity epidemic as well, so especially the type 2 diabetes. Um, uh, children are also now developing type 2 diabetes, so it's not just type 1. We used to think of uh, children as being uh, just uh, in insulin dependent sort of type 1 diabetics, but because of obesity, we think that that's increasing that risk. And it's the leading cause of vision loss in, in Americans 20 to 64, so kind of the um, the working class, the working age group, so an important group. Um, this, these are the terms that you'll hear, type 1 di uh, diabetes mellitus, which insulin dependent or immune mediated. Type 2 is non-insulin dependent. Type 2 is interestingly the one that um, seems to have a genetic, more of a genetic predisposition, or a ge I mean a genetic association. Prediabetes is high blood sugar. And gestational diabetes would be high blood sugar around 24 weeks gestation of pregnancy. Um, so the National Health and Nutrition Examination found that the epidemiology of diabetic retinopathy now, we're talking about blacks 27%, Mexican Americans 33%, and whites 18%. Um, these are just numbers that I think are are good to remember because they, they do tend to be on boards. <laughs> the Wisconsin studies, 20 year duration of diabetes, 99% of type one diabetics have some form of retinopathy and 60% of type two diabetics. And remember that when we think, so when we think about risk factors, okay, we think of di the duration of diabetes as very important, and it's easy to sort of, or it's easier to figure out when that occurred in type 1, because they often uh, present with like ketoacidosis or some major event. But type 2 diabetics can, it's really hard to figure out when the duration is, and we don't know what effect prediabetes also might be having to that whole equation. So duration becomes problematic in studies of type 2. Um, glycemic control is very important. Um, so, and the DCCT, which is the Diabetes Complica Complications and Control Trial, I believe, that was done in the U.S. In the U.K., PDS was done in the U.K., that the recommendations are still to keep A1C less than 7. The um, ACCORD study in the U.S. has also looked at even more rigid, more stringent control of, of glucose as well as blood pressure. Um, and it's, you know, I think the, the more stringent the glucose control, the better, but the more stringent the blood pressure control, there can be a risk of other um, mortality and morbidity. So what I do is just try to get my diabetic patients in with their internists and, and have them do what their internist recommends. because. 
the rules are, I think, a little more complicated based on how old the person is and what their sort of cardiovascular risk factors are as well. Um, proteinuria and cholesterol or dyslipidemia, these are all considered risk factors. And so I talk about the ABCs to my patients, A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, but I also strongly encourage them to work with their internists for just the reasons I gave you. Um, and then remember that if a patient is having trouble with their glycemic control, that in diabetes, their wound healing is, is off, and sometimes their ability to uh, sense pain is off. So they can have a tooth abscess and not really know anything going on. So make sure that, you know, think about infections, occult MIs, dental care, foot care, all these things can be very important and, and life-saving uh, for diabetic patients. Um, and then the other thing, too, that sometimes comes up is that it, it's important that they have vision that's good enough so that they can take care of themselves, particularly if they're on insulin and they're trying to administer that. So they're, they're, it's a complex interweaving when we manage the care of diabetic patients. Um, when somebody comes into our office to be examined, it's, it's a pretty, it, it, it's almost like looking at an x-ray in a way. You, you think of the visual acuity, you think about cornea is, is healthy. You look for NVI, right, of the iris. You um, check their pupils, obviously, and then you go through and characterize, you classify the severity of diabetic retinopathy, and we'll go through that. And then you also classify whether or not there's macular edema. And then based on your classification, you can make a recommendation either for treatment or when the diabetic patient should have continued follow-up. And in patients without any retinopathy, pretty much the, the recommendation now is yearly eye exams. Um, it, it is a little different for type 1. I think it's if they've had a five-year duration. But um, yearly eye exams to come in to uh, just be screened. But then if they have retinopathy, that gets uh, shorter in duration that we see them. But despite the fact that yearly eye examinations can reduce the risk of blindness by like almost 98%, that the compliance rate is l l like less than 50% nationwide. So it's, it's, and when you think about what a patient with diabetes has to do, I mean, they're going to their internists, they're taking all this medication. So there are a lot of things that we can improve on to manage their eye care as well. And some people are, are exploring telemedicine, but also even the idea, we, we worked on this at, in New Orleans, the idea of having the primary care physician have a camera right in their office. So like when their patient would come in and get an A1C, they could go in and get pictures, and, and those are sent. But there are sometimes things that seem to make sense and, and work aren't always easy to implement because of insurance and, you know, whether or not people want to lose patients. I, anyway, but these are things that may be changing in the future. So remember that diabetic patients, especially type 1, can be at high risk of vitreous hemorrhage, proliferative, they can have proliferative retinopathy and have absolutely no symptoms at all. And so the, the, that's why we want to do these uh, screening exams. So the, cause, the main causes of vision loss in diabetic retinopathy include macular edema, macular ischemia, which is not, we used to say is not that common, but we were actually able to quantify macular ischemia better than we ever were. So we, I don't think we really know how, how much of an effect it has. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And then metabolic effects, effects and possibly ischemia as well on retinal ganglion cells and neurons. And so it's diabetic retinal neuropathy in a sense. So that can also be a cause of vision loss. So um, I think one of the things that I find very, um, so just practically, you know, you're, you have the patient in your slit lamp, they're dilated. And what I like to do is, so I know we have OCTs now, so not, you know, we don't have to 
I mean, we still want to look at the macula and look for retinal thickening. Thickening is the key to associated with vision loss. So that's, that's the important thing to look for. But then you want to look at the, the areas. Let me see if I have a picture of that. So you want to look all the way around the optic nerve and the arcades. So there, they used to be, we used to think of the seven, there were seven standard fields that one was centered on the optic nerve, two was centered on the fovea, three was temporal, then four, five, six, seven were in the quadrants um, around the arcades. I don't think anyone really does that, and I don't think it's very often. And I don't think it's, it, you know, you can, you can get by with less than that now. When we do a montage, we kind of get that picture. But basically, those four, five, six, seven, those fields around the arcades are the ones that we use to characterize the severity of retinopathy. And then we look for things like hemorrhages and microaneurysms, venous beading. I'm going to show you examples of this. Um, IRMA, which is intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. And there's some uh, controversy what IRMA is, but I think people, so it's, it's sort of aberrant remodeling of the capillaries when, and when, they, when there's some ischemia. So you'll, you'll instead of seeing sort of nice cap, you'll, I'll show you, but they, you, they form shunts. And some people also think of IRMA as intraretinal uh, neovascularization. So there, it has two, and they can leak as well on angiography. Um, and so the, I think of it this practically, okay? I see a patient and I look at the four quadrants and I think the four to one rule four quadrants of microaneurysms or hemorrhage, two of venous beating, and one field of IRMA. And I'm going to show you pictures of each of those, and you can find them, you can actually get them online now. So you just Google, and it's like the Wisconsin, I think, epidemiologic study is where these come from. So this is the standard field, uh, and this is based on studies like in the diabetic retinopathy studies way long ago. But this is um, the fields that's, this is considered what you need, hemorrhage and microaneurysms uh, for uh, one quadrant to make severe, uh, severe diabetic retinopathy, sorry. So, uh, so you need four quadrants of this to be considered severe uh, diabetic retinopathy. And this person probably has hypertension as well. It sort of looks there maybe a little bit. It doesn't matter. If you say, oh, I don't know if that's a hemorrhage or a microaneurysm. According to the study, it didn't make a difference. It's just that basically red spots of that characteristic, four quadrants of that is severe NPDR. Venous beating. Venous beating is different from tortuosity. Okay, so tortuosity, the vessel does this. Venous beating, the vessel does this. And you can see an example of that here where it looks, we don't really know what it is, but some people feel that it's where the endothelial cells are trying to, are getting stimulated to grow out or up. So they're going in the wrong, in the wrong direction. Two quadrants of venous beating, severe NPDR. Irma, okay, so this is the least amount of Irma you need to call severe NPDR. So Irma here, we have sort of capillaries that are dilated and sort of stop. Or here, maybe this is starting to do some neovascularization, but it kind of goes off into this capillary here. So basically, you need three areas of Irma within one field to be considered severe NPDR. And then if you have two of those, so if you have four hemorrhages and two of venous beating or four hemorrhages and one of Irma, that's very severe NPTR. And then based on that, we make recommendations, oh, not here, sorry. We make recommendations of how soon to see the patients based on what the risk, and this was from the diabetic retinopathy study. And this has, is under a little bit of change now because a lot of this was based on when do we put patients through panretinal photocoagulation, which is that, you know, uh, you know, 1,600, 1,800, 2,000 spots all in the peripheral retina of laser treatment. 
And that treatment is very effective, but it also leads to visual field decline and night blindness. So it, it does, and, and it may make macular edema worse. So at least from protocol S, it does seem that those patients may not do as well as, as, NP, uh, as anti vegf but we'll go through that. So basically, if they have, so I look at severe practically. This is what I do with my patients. I say, does the person have severe NPDR? Consider PRP in type two, and I, I go two to four months. I, I probably, and, and there are a lot of times where I say moderately severe, and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then it turns out everyone does that. You know, everyone says moderately severe. So I go, you know, two to four to six months. Anything less, but with diabetes, I try to do less than a year. I tell the patients to come in earlier and hope they come in in a year. And then macular edema, we actually, we don't use the term clinically significant macular edema, and I haven't spent a lot of time going over it. It's based, the, it, but it, it may be on your boards. It's really based on retinal thickening. So retinal thickening is a key ingredient in macular edema. And then it depends on how, whether or not it's within 500 microns of the fovea in association with or without edgy So they're all in your book, and it's good to know them for, for the boards. But when practically when we take care of diabetics now, there is a little bit of a judgment call when we, when we uh, treat patients uh, for macular edema. And we don't consider laser as often now as we do. So neovascularization um, elsewhere and of the disc. So here, this is just showing NVE. This is a part of proliferative. So I showed you what's severe. That's all the category of non-proliferative retinopathy. Now we're going into the category of proliferative retinopathy. And proliferative retinopathy means that blood vessels grow outside of the internal limiting membrane into the vitreous, and they often leak on, with fluorescein dye. And that's called neovascularization, and it can be neovascularization of the disc, neovascularization elsewhere, and the other part of proliferative retinopathy is the result of neovascularization, which is vitreous hemorrhage. So once the vitreous hemorrhage occurs, there appears to be an interaction, and maybe also from the blood vessels in the, the leaky blood vessels in the neovascularization elsewhere with the vitreous collagen fibers. And it's like a wound healing effect. You can start to get contraction just like you would on your hand if you cut yourself. And that contraction causes the retina to be detached and a tractional detachment. So neovascularization of the disc, oh, this is blown out, but th this was the figure, standard figure 10 a or something like that from the DRS study. And it was about a quarter to a third disc diameter, but this turned out to be a big disc. So that's why people say maybe it's a third disc diameter. So that was considered significant neovascularization of the disc. And then high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy, that's when we consider treatment. Okay, so if you see a little bit of neovascularization of the disc, that's early proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But again, practically, when we have a patient in our office, you know, and now with anti vegf and that, I think we're going to be changing our, the way that we practically take care of patients, and there will probably be a lot more clinical trials testing whether or not these, what seems like a good idea, are actually clinically good ideas. But this is how you would define, this is how I thought was the easiest. So there are four characteristics that you want to take into account when you're thinking about high risk PDR. You think of neovascularization just by itself, of the disc or elsewhere, that's one. Neovascularization of the disc. So automatically, if you have neovascularization of the disc, you score two. Then size, and if it's about a quarter to a third disc diameter, here it's less than a quarter, but it's <clears throat> about that size of NVD, that's another risk factor. So if you have NVD that's a third of a disc diameter, that's three risk factors, that patient has high risk PDR automatically. If it's NVE, it has to be a half disc, disc area. And then vitreous hemorrhage. So each one of those gets one point, and you want three of four points.
And where it becomes sort of a judgment call again is if you have a patient with type 2 diabetes who comes in with a vitreous hemorrhage, you can't see NVE because there's vitreous hemorrhage. And then the other eye has no retinopathy. So what do you do first? Yes? Okay, check their carotids, that's a good idea. That's, I mean, good for the, and you're thinking like. If it's that asymmetric. Very good, very good, good point. And what would you do as far as a test in ophthalmology or even a potential, an ultrasound? Because what are we thinking? It might be just a PVD with a retinal tear. So you always wanna make sure it's not that. I mean, it's easy to get, um, uh, I, I hate questions like that because you're like, well, what's the context? <laughs> but, but always think about that if it's that asymmetric. But you can look at the other eye. If you see like very severe NPDR in that eye and you have a vitreous hemorrhage and the ultrasound doesn't show a retinal detachment or a retinal tear, which you sometimes can see with ultrasound, um, then you would probably initiate treatment as if that were um, um, PDR, and I would probably at this stage give anti-VEGF at this point. That's probably what I would do, but it's each patient is a little different. Okay, so vitreous PDR causes vitreous hemorrhage, fractional retinal detachment. The, the reasons why PRP were done, it was thought that there were areas of avascular retina which were hypoxic that stimulated the production of growth factors like the EGF, which caused blood vessels to grow into the vitreous. And um, so if you reduce the photoreceptor metabolism by killing them, you reduce the demand for oxygen, so that's one theory. You reduce the cells making the angiogenic factor, that's another theory. And then one theory is thinning the retina and allowing choroidal oxygen into the retina, and, and that probably has the least evidence. But there are other treatments, steroids. Um, there's evidence that like Ozerdex and other steroids can reduce, at least for diabetic macular edema, right? And we also, um, the anti-VEGF we're gonna go through and then potentially neuroprotective effects. PRP, I don't wanna, I wanna make sure we have enough time, so PRP, I like, if you have a patient who's got uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and has a lot of evidence of inflammatory effects, because inflammation also is important in diabetes, and the way, like a lot of IRMA, leaky on fluorescein or a very ischemic fundus looking, I like to slowly do the PRP rather than do it all at once. Um, and the reason I do that is, especially if you have a lot of NVE and D, is I think you can get a crunch phenomenon with a lot of PRP just like you can with anti-VEGF. So it's <coughs> sort of the same approach that you're pharmacologically modulating your effect by only doing a little bit of PRP at a time. The other reason is I think PRP is inflammogenic as well, and so you're adding inflammation. So that, that's my approach with that. Okay. And we know there are complications, so there are also complications from injections. And I think the big thing with anti-VEGF to remember is this, if you've got somebody who's not compliant and you're saying, look, you need to come in every month for injections, and, and they're not gonna do that, they come, you know, they say, wow, I can see so much better, and then they don't come in, then they can come back with a much, I mean, they, they, time elapses, and they may have um, more severe disease, just from not getting the regular treatment, because the anti-VEGF wears off. Okay, so um, there's been a paradigm shift uh, that be based on anti-VEGF in macular edema. Visual acuity is significantly better two times more in patients treated with anti-VEGF than laser, and there's clinical trial evidence for that. Um, so why do we even think of anti-VEGF in diabetic retinopathy? Well, you know that I just talked about the theories about why people get proliferative retinopathy. Well, in diabetic macular edema, VEGF is actually a permeability factor. In fact, that's how it was first discovered, was it was called vasoprolifer... Vaso what was it called? VPF. What did that stand for? Vascular permeability factor. That's what it was. And um, so it, it's 
it, and it, um, so that, that's the reason why we would think about stopping its effect. The other reason is that it is essential for viability. A single allele knockout of VEGF or one of its receptors leads to death of the animal and mice. But that requirement wanes over development. Um, and then it's also been increased in patients with diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, and proliferative retinopathy. And as I said, it causes processes involved in the pathophysiology of diabetes and, and or diabetic retinopathy and DME, permeability, angiogenesis, and it disorders cleavage planes of dividing endothelial cells, and it's also a survival factor for endothelial cells. There's also crosstalk between VEGF and other signaling pathways that are important in diabetes, like inflammatory pathways, oxidative pathways, metabolic events. So all these things can feed into each other, and you get these feed-forward loops that drive the pathology. You know, our body usually wants to restore homeostasis. So if you do one event, there's usually another thing that comes in and makes everything okay, <laughs> copacetic, so to speak. But then if you have something that's driving the process, then it overwhelms the natural mechanisms to restore homeostasis, and that's what's really needed in pathology. There's early pericyte and endothelial damage, and uh, there can be uh, late consequences of hypoxia from avascularized retina. So we know the current treatments. We really, um, renovizumab and bevacizumab are antibodies to the ligand, so they bind the VEGF ligand so it can't get to its receptor to trigger signaling. A flibercept is actually a fusion protein of VEGF receptor R1 and R2, so it's actually like a little trap taking the two receptors so that the ligand binds it and then the VEGF doesn't go to the other receptors. So it works a little bit differently in that regard. And because it has R1 and R2, it also gets placental growth factor. And pegaptinib is a VEGF165 aptamer, and an aptamer is a type of RNA uh, type of uh, drug. And it's not as effective as the other drugs. So this just shows the different isoforms of VEGF. 165 is the most abundant uh, expressed uh, and it has both, the, the longer ones have this heparin binding domain, which makes them cell associated, so they tend to hang out in the extracellular matrix. 165 has both, so it can be soluble, released, secreted, so when it's released by a cell, it can circu you know, circulate throughout the retina and have effects in a, a cell that's not right next to it. Okay, and that just shows sort of the different is a fusion protein of the R1, R2, and then they have an FC portion of IgG, and then this is actually an antibody that's created against the ligand. Okay, let's get, okay. So I'm gonna skip through a lot of these because I want to, and you have access to this, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, we know about the OCT. The, the one thing is, that the DRCR net did, a, I think, a great study. I don't know that people use it very much, but where they looked at OCT association with, that, with visual acuity, and it's not directly correlated with that, but when you take the log of the OCT, there's a better association. But remember, too, that a lot of things are happening. So we tend to think of retinal thickening, so bigger OCT, <coughs> with poor vision, right? But you can have a patient that has retinal thinning because they've had a vein occlusion or they've had some, uh, some neuropathy, right? So their, their retinas are thin. And you can even have that thin retina then get edematous and be normal. So OCT is not quite necessarily associated with visual acuity, but it's still a good thing to, to uh, measure, to use, quantitative measure. I recommend that you look through all the slices because you can then evaluate these other processes. Uh, oh, basically, just time and spectral domain, they can't be interchangeable, but they're both good. So if you have a time domain OCT, and you follow it over time, that's a reasonable way to follow your patients, just like a spectral domain OCT. Um, so I'm just, so there are a lot of studies, but I'm just kind of gonna go through the, 
one line caption of them. So initially, bevacizumab was found to improve vision, reduce OCT thickness in the short term, and then ranibizumab and deferred laser, this is just for diabetic macular edema, was better than laser alone. And that it, this was a study where it seemed that if you continued, this is through DRCRnet, that if you continued to do monthly ranibizumab injections, but then only, so you did that initially, but then only did ranibizumab injections if you had OCT thickening, it turns out that over time, the number of injections needed for diabetic macular edema became less. And that was a critical thinking, or a critical thing, because it was kind of like, well, are we changing the natural course of diabetic retinopathy? Then um, this is from the protocol T, where they looked at a flibercept. So they did a, this was a, this was like a landmark study because it was a head-to-head. -head. You know, a lot of times we look at studies and we have one that treated with bevacizumab and one with ranibizumab at three milligrams and, you know, <laughs> 0.3 milligrams, and, and, and then you can't really compare those. Those are separate studies, different patients. I mean, you get an idea, but you cannot say, well, this was 25% and this was 30%. This was a head-to-head -head study of a flibercept, uh, ranibizumab, and bevacizumab. And this note that it uses the 0.3 milligrams and this was for diabetic macular edema. So we could actually compare the three different treatments. And what they basically found was that a flibercep or ILEA did better for patients who had 2050 vision or worse than either bevacizumab or ranibizumab. And it did better in visual acuity, but also that they needed fewer laser treatments. And OCT central subfield thickness was driven by the initial visual acuity, and worse visual acuity was associated with greater reduction in thickness. Dr. Hernan, can I just ask you? Yes. Have you found that? insurance companies are supportive of these findings yet, or are they still making you, like, do you have a diabetic macular edema patient that has, you know, worse than 2050 vision, are they still wanting you to trial a past 10? I've, some, years? some have, yes. But, but they, I think, so what I usually do with Erica is I have to write a letter and give the reason okay. and the evidence. But I don't know, I don't think I've had enough of them. It's a really good question. I don't think I've had enough of them to be able to Come, you know, have a, a sense. Do, have you heard of others having trouble? Uh, I know London when I was on, but it was just like right after it came out, so I didn't know if that had changed. Yeah, I think hopefully it has. And then ranibizumab, the rise and ride studies, those are the, the key studies with this. These are phase three our, uh, randomized clinical trials testing the efficacy and safety of intravitreal ranibizumab compared to sham, and um, they found more serious events with the 0.5 versus, well, the 0.3. Actually, they both have serious events. But remember the rise and ride study, the way that they were designed was they had imposed monthly injections. The DRCRnet studies are based on whether or not there's OCT thickening. I mean, it's, it's, they're sort of complicated formulas. But it's not that the investigator would make the decision whether or not to give in an injection. Okay, so the patients didn't necessarily get 12 injections the first year. You saw it was like eight to nine. Rise and ride, the first two years were imposed injections. So the take home for me, I'm gonna skip through a lot of this. I think you've seen those before, is that there is a safety risk in diabetic patients with macular edema if you impose monthly injections. So you should review the OCT and make a decision based on that. Okay. Um, now, I want to get into the PDR study and protocol S, too. So why do we even think about diabetic retinopathy severity? So the, the VEGF pathways that are relevant to severity include those that disorder, angiogenic growth, there are survival fat, uh, uh, pathways, PI3 kinase, um, NOx4, JAK stat signaling. You probably won't be asked that. Um, but they, they're also, they, there can be an increase in retinal non-perfusion. And this is something that is counter, but th this was, I mean, this is one of the things we did in our lab 
we thought that if we gave anti-VEGF in models of retina of, of intravitreal neovascularization, so neovascularization into the vitreous, that we would reduce that, but we would also increase avascular retina because it's an angiogenic inhibitor, right? But what, ha what we found out was that the, one of the ways that it works is that it reorders the dividing cleavage planes of the endothelial cells, the cleavage planes of the dividing endothelial cells. And when the cleavage planes are set up so they're perpendicular to the long axis of the vessel, the, the blood vessel grows straight out. But when they start to become erratic, the blood vessels grow up into the vitreous. And if you normalize them by reducing the veg up without totally abolishing it, you actually get more vascularization into the avascular retina. The other reason that it may uh, affect this is by reducing adhesion molecules in the endothelial cells. So, so you get less blockage of the capillaries, so the non-perfusion goes away. So, and, and, Okay, you have pictures of that. Okay. Um, the, um, actually, I'm just going to, sorry, I thought I would, I, it's not like I didn't, I did plan this talk. I just want to make sure we have time for the, the, the talk. Okay. And then there were, I mean, for the quiz. And then there were these studies that actually showed that when you gave bevacizumab, the Bolt study, there was, there was no difference in retinal non-perfusion. And people were like, wow, that's interesting. And then RISE and RISE actually showed there was reduced retinal non-perfusion in patients who were given ranibizumab compared to sham. And then there was a study that uh, ranibizumab for diabetic macular edema reduced worsening of retinopathy in patients. So in other words, the patients, if you followed them over time in the ranibizumab versus sham group, these guys didn't go on and get more severe, whereas these did. Then they found there was actually improvement in diabetic retinopathy. Holy cow. So they had to do these studies. The reason they did studies like this is because to say with a bunch of patients, we're going to give anti-VEGF for your diabetic retinopathy when you already have standard of care. You know, we're going to do this and we're just going to follow you out and see if you get worse. It would be unethical. So they had to take this kind of strategic approach in the clinical trials. And then the recent protocol S, ranibizumab, was non-inferior to PRP and proliferative retinopathy. And they had less visual field loss, fewer new DME. And so one of the things to remember about protocol S is that patients who had diabetic macular edema, so this protocol S was you had proliferative retinopathy. Okay, so it was testing PRP versus ranibizumab for um, proliferative retinopathy, right? And you had the, so you had laser and you had ranibizumab, but the patients who had DME already, because it's already been, uh, you know, this the standard would be to give anti-VEGF, right? Those patients, or laser, those patients could be treated at the discretion of the investigator with ranibizumab or laser. So 54% of the patients in the laser-only group were getting ranibizumab versus the ranibizumab-only group, okay? So you actually had three groups in a sense, even though they were two. And so they were powered to look at just the two groups, but when they did sort of a post hoc analysis, what they found is that the patients who had DME and PDR they improved their average vision. So again, that's another thing. They, they looked at the area under the curve to get sort of the average visual changes over time. So they, they improved their average vision um, when they were only given ranibizumab versus when they had laser and ranibizumab. So it almost seemed like laser itself, I mean, that has to be tested, but it almost seemed like laser itself may be harmful to the whole process. So, I mean, I think that's really interesting. And so how it's changed my clinical, how I take care of patients now is, if I have a compliant diabetic, and that's the key, right? Because PRP, if they don't come back, you can do PRP, and you can sort of say, oh, okay, I can sleep better at night. This patient's not gonna have tractional detachment, from, or, or less likely, they, they still should have follow-up, but you know. But if they're compliant and they've got PDR and diabetic macular edema, my first recommendation is ranibizumab. The other thing that, that we, that's important to remember is that 
the patients with diabetic macular edema, and there are clinical trials that I think I skipped over here, but just this is a take home. If you defer treatment with ranibizumab, those patients don't seem to catch up if you give it later. So their visual acuity, on average, is not as good as patients who get ranibizumab right off the bat. So if you have someone who comes in and you feel that they're, they're um, indicated to have treatment, then I would treat them early. What happens when you have 20-20 vision? That's tough because there's always an injection issue. I would follow them very closely and work with them and try to get them, you know, remember that all the studies with the DRC are not, they're talking about little changes in visual acuity, you know, 2032, 2040. But those are still important changes to a patient. So maybe we should be treating macular edema with 2020 patients. I know a lot of time, if it's in the fovea, I do. If it's not in the fovea, I don't always. So what about risks? The main risks, because VEGF is important in adult homeostasis, there have been a number of studies that have shown that if you take away VEGF, that you lose the chorial capillaris, that you hurt the photoreceptors, that you hurt Mueller cells, okay, all these things. So, and we don't know, we have no way of knowing what VEGF is in a diabetic patient when they come into our office. We assume that it's high when they have the macular edema, right? And we assume that it's high when we see the neovascularization. We assume when we give the anti-VEGF that it goes down, but we're not measuring VEGF and seeing if we're really neutralizing how much VEGF happens to be in that individual diabetic eye. So there's a little bit of an assumption there. So that for the eye, there's been sustained intraocular pressure elevation with ranibizumab. This was done through DRC or NET. In pharmacokinetics, there's been reduced plasma VEGF after bevacizumab, um, mainly, but also a flibercep, and uh, less free plasma VEGF. Rise and Ride had vascular and non-fatal MI or stroke. So initially, when they only looked at the APTC um, indicators of what would be a severe event, they had smaller, lower uh, risk rate, but then when, when more was known about what anti-VEGF does, I mean, it's, it, when you give it for tumors, you get hypertension, you can have stroke. So when you include all those others in the broader definition, the risk factors are much, I mean, the adverse events are much higher. Um, DRCR notch in the protocol S found no difference between PRP and ranibizumab, and that was, I think, 0.5 milligrams. So, you know, and, and you might say, well, why if it's 0.3 and that's what we give for diabetic macular edema, why did they look at 0.5? And it sort of depends on when the study was started and what the decisions were made for the clinical trial. But those are important things to consider when you're, when you're thinking about your patients and trying to make a plan for them. So, um, my, the, oh, I'm sorry, I really did go through this. The bottom line that I think of is I use 0.3 because the rise and ride, I, 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 there, because recent studies, let me just go back here, showed uh, increase in diabetic macular edema patients with the highest exposure. So of a flibercept or ranibizumab, 0.5, and when it was imposed monthly. So I think we're safer if we don't impose it monthly. I also consider very carefully if a patient has a, a, a previous stroke or has risk factors for that and isn't being treated, I might not go with bevacizumab, for example. I might do ranibizumab 0.3. The question is, if you have a 2030 diabetic patient with macular edema, would you use bevacizumab or ranibizumab? I think it's fine to use bevacizumab if you don't have you know, worries about safety and systemic health. I think after 2050 or worse, I would use a flibercept. I would try to do that. Okay, so let's um, go over, and, and these are conclusions. Let's go over the quiz. Oh, and then I, what I gave you, so I went through, because I gave this, like I gave part of this t talk at Arvo, and then I also recently gave a talk in Vienna on the PDR stuff. So. I just gave you kind of a sketch of, and these are from like 2012, various clinical trials. 
I mean, I, I encourage you to read them, and you know, if you find, if you don't agree with some of this, I wouldn't take my stuff as, as uh, the absolute, but this is, um, th th it can give you just a little bit of a sketch, because sometimes it's hard to remember all these, I think, you know, putting them together, and so I went through and did it systematically. Okay, so let's go over the quiz. We still have a few minutes to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Anyone qu have questions that they, anything that? Okay. All right, let's go. Which are believed mechanisms to, for reduced capillary support for diabetic retina? You can just, it might be more than one. So A is one, right? I can, that's one of the adhesion molecules that can, um, Okay, and then D, pericyte dropout, reduced permeability of vessels, that's not true. And they do have antithrombin-3 deficiency, but that I don't think should cause non-perfusion, right? Okay. Why does diabetic retinopathy have reduced vision, do we think of? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm right and then I don't think C if anything they probably have more cytokine release and what is the other what is another reason that they can have decreased vision retinal detachment that's right but also retinal neuropathy okay. diabetic retinopathy occurs in about 90 percent of type 1 diabetic patients by five years false, false. okay and it's, it, it's like 20 years, right, when you start to see any retinopathy in type 1. So if OCT is not available, okay, so <laughs> pretend like you're somewhere where there's no OCT. Diabetic macular edema is best diagnosed by central visual field, fluorescein angiography, or slit lamp biomicroscopy. Pardon? Actually, slit lamp. Well, I mean, does somebody else tell you something else now? Because things are evolving, but we always think of retinal thickening as the key thing, and you can do that by slit lamp biomicroscopy. Uh, the macular edema, sometimes it, it can be edema or staining. I don't know. So, Russell, has, has, have other people said something different? No, that was my thought. Oh, I think that, that for your boards, it's probably still better to think of retinal thickening. But be on the lookout because we may find that may be changed as we have better ways to quantify things. I mean, we have better imaging. Everything is different now. You know, it's just constantly evolving. But way back, it was retinal thickening and not exudates and not necessarily fluorescein leakage. High risk PDR is classified as. Okay. Not, not of the intrinsic capillaries. <laughs> sorry. I hate questions like that. Who made these? I guess I made these. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a terrible question. I'll have to change that. Vitreous hemorrhage in a diabetic patient with severe. So, so let's look at each one individually, OK? The reason, yeah, so it's dilation and leakage, but it's not of the intrinsic capillaries. They have to grow outside the in, inner limiting membrane into the vitreous. And of course, you do have Cloquet's canal there, but still they have to grow off the surface of the uh, optic nerve. How about vitreous hemorrhage in a diabetic with severe NPDR? This is after the ultrasound, so it shows no retinal detachment or break. I, yes, I think so, because you're making the assumption the NV is of big enough size and it's underneath the vitreous hemorrhage. Neovascularization into the vitreous in association with clinically significant macular edema. What do you need to know there before you can make the call? The size, right? Okay. Okay, aspirin use can slow the progression of nonproliferative diabetic retinopathy over three years. Good. You read. <laughs> Since the advent of anti VEGF agents, improvement in macular edema is seen in 80% of patients. It's false. It's about 
So even though I said it's a paradigm shift, it's not the end all be all. We still need to know more about why diabetes. So practically, I start with anti-VEGF in a diabetic patient with macular edema. If it doesn't work after three or four times, and I, then I may go to, I try a steroid. Why is this not working? And there we go. The 4 to 1 rule in diabetes diagnosis is that four microaneurysms associated with two disc areas of retinal thickness and at least one exudate within three disc areas mm -hmm. of the fovea indicates an eye in need of photocoagulation. False. Yeah, that was false. I thought I was kind of, I thought that was a pretty clever, <laughs> don't you think, question? So, what is the 4 to 1 rule? <coughs> Yes, good. Uh, Very good. Excellent. Okay, good. And then that would be severe NPDR, and we would think you get photocoagulation, and you know, I have to look at protocol S. Does anyone remember if they considered? I think it was only PDR for that. Okay, all features below that are predictive for severe NPDR or are part of NPDR, let's say are part of NPDR. So I think you gave them, right? We have venous feeding, okay, what, and hemorrhages, right? Those are both two. What about exudates? Are they in the, the classification for, no, they're not. What about cotton wool spots? No, very good and intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, or IRMA, so, okay. So a patient with diabetic macular edema presents with OCT thickening and visual acuity at 2060. Based on the DRCR net study, treatment may be best by? Excellent, right, and why is that? Based on the visual acuity, right? And visual acuity 2050 or less. The single common feature of the definitions of clinically significant macular edema from diabetes was heart exudates. False, right, what is it? Good. Treatment of PDR with ranibizumab was found non-inferior to treatment with PRP. True, good. All right, I'm a little over, but thank you all. Thank you. You're welcome.